I'm here today to have the privilege, distinct privilege, of uh, presenting to you the Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. The organization I'm proud to be a part of as a uh, former police officer with 36 years of death. And I uh, had the privilege of being a, had kind of a starring role in the legalization of marijuana in uh, our home state of Colorado. So, we, we managed to get that done there. We're working on other places. It's my privilege to present the Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, Major Neil Franklin. Thanks a lot, Tony. Tony, if you need more energy, uh, you got to get like a large coffee at least three or four or five times a day to take care of that. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I want to thank you for allowing me to take a few minutes to speak to you about some very important issues. I want to thank Tony Ryan, obviously, for the, for the effort and the service that he has given this wonderful organization of lead law enforcement against prohibition. But Tony's very modest. Tony was the actual face of that campaign in the media, on commercials and so on, as a retired lieutenant from the Denver Police Department and made a huge impact in getting Measure 64 passed in Colorado. So join me again in giving Tony a hand around the Tony. So again, my name is Neil Franklin, I'm a retired major from the Maryland State Police. I'm also a former colonel, lieutenant colonel with the Baltimore Police Department. And uh, thank you, thank you, friend. Um, and I'm currently the executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. For, many, for those of you who don't know about LEAD Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, it's an international organization of law enforcement professionals. It's cops, police, police officers, judges, criminal prosecutors, uh, another uh, member of our organization, a name that you'll recognize, who's here today, is uh, Judge Jim Gray. Yes. Excellent speaker. I've learned a lot from him uh, during my time speaking for the organization. And again, we're an international organization uh, with branches in six other countries. We're headquartered here in the United States. And we speak out regarding the policies of prohibition. The policies of prohibition. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you want to legalize freedom, we can begin with legalizing all drugs. All drugs. And as I get more into my talk, you'll hear more about those reasons why. So Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, we have this wonderful Speakers Bureau of these wonderful folks. Many are retired. Some are still in service, like Tony Kirk, who is also a, a libertarian, he's here, uh, running around doing the work of the party, and uh, we make a huge impact. One of the co-founders of the organization, Peter Chris, says, you may not agree with us, but because we were on the front lines of the war on drugs, you can't tell us that we don't know what we're talking about. And that's very true. So the organization today, we have thousands of members, and we have uh, close to 200,000 supporters globally, and we're continuing to grow as an organization. And we realize that these policies of drug prohibition were actually counterproductive to public safety. And that's the one thing that we signed on for, to improve public safety in this country and in other areas around the globe. And how can we, here in the United States, the land of the free, be responsible for 25% of the world's prisoners when we are only 5% of the world's population. It's because of our policies of drug prohibition. Because back in the early 70s, we only had about 400,000 people in prison, and today it's 2.3 million. And that's still in the span of time for the five, four to five decades of the war on drugs, which is a war on people. So that's the work that we do in LEAP. In a nutshell, I don't have a lot of time to talk, so I'm going to move through this rather quickly. Just a little bit more about my career of 34 years in law enforcement, mainly in the state of Maryland. 
Near the beginning of my career, I was in narcotics state. I worked undercover. I made a lot of arrests. Personally made a lot of arrests. And most of those arrests folks were just for mere marijuana possession. Just possession. Today, we're still arresting, even with what we've done in Colorado, Washington State, Oregon, Washington, D.C., and Alaska. We're still arresting over 600,000 people every year in this country for marijuana possession alone. I'm not talking about distribution. I'm talking about possession. We talk about your freedoms. A mere arrest for marijuana will limit your freedoms in this country. It will limit your opportunities for getting a job. It will limit your opportunities to go to school. It will limit your opportunities to housing and more and more and more. After working undercover, I commanded nine drug task forces at one time. I became the, the commander for the Northeast region of the Bureau of Drug and Criminal Enforcement in the state of Maryland. And now I'm responsible for ordering men and women to go out here and arrest thousands of people every year in my home state of Maryland. The law enforcement community, because of things like the policies of war and drugs, we've closed ourselves off from society. And it's this us versus them mentality as we go about our work. And the reason I say that is because I went about this work for a couple of decades before I even realized what the hell was going on. I didn't know how many people we were arrested. I didn't know what the results of that was. I didn't know what it was costing this country. Every year, in hard costs, in police, cops, courtrooms, and prisons, $50 billion minimum every year coming out of your pockets. And that's just enforcing our drug laws. There were so many other things that I didn't know about. You know, and, and i tell you something else. Even though in policing, when we graduate from the academy, we raise our right hand and we say that we're taking an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, <coughs> Our policies of drug prohibition and the work that we do on that foundation are completely against our oath. Completely against our oath. There's a short video I did that you can you can look up um, with Cato. It's entitled "Why Liberty." So you can look that up, Why Liberty, Neil Franklin, and I talk about how the war on drugs affects our liberties and erodes at our liberties. So, you know, ending, ending these policies of drug prohibition, and this is one of the reasons, you know, and, and I'm, I'm speaking for law enforcement against prohibition, and, you know, I also have my, my personal views about some things separate from the organization's message, but I'm going to tell you something. I believe that ending the war on drugs is a fight that every libertarian should be engaged in. Every single libertarian. And here's the reason why. There is no other single issue responsible for eroding as many basic liberties in this country than these policies of drug prohibition. Let's start with the Constitution, Bill of Rights. Let's start with the Fourth Amendment. And the numbers of searches that we do of people, cars, homes in this country, absolutely astonishing. You know, marijuana alone, because of its distinct odor and, and case law and so on, if I smell it about your person, that gives me the right to arrest you and then search you. And your car, and your home and whatever else I feel like I want to search. And these policies have been abused so much that, you know what? If you were to leave here and drive away from here and get stopped by a police officer and they say that they smell marijuana, whether they do or don't, they will search your car, search you, and even if there is no odor, how can you prove it? What is your recourse? And unfortunately, unfortunately, we do have some police officers that do work in that manner.
Let's talk about the Fifth Amendment. Civil forfeiture. Civil forfeiture. Also, when they stop you, under the example that I just gave you, and they happen to find maybe two or three thousand dollars in your glove compartment, maybe you're on your way to, to buy a car that you, you, you've seen on eBay or something. They can seize that cash, as they do many times over and over on our highways across this country. They can seize that cash, give you a receipt, and make you come back and prove that your cash is innocent of being involved in any illegal dealings. It's just the way it is. And it's going to cost you more probably than what they've seized, so therefore they end up keeping your cash. By far and large, most of the cash seizures that police make across this country today, and it's billions of dollars, is just a few hundred dollars from people that they stop on a daily basis on our streets. Civil forfeiture, even though there have been some reforms around the country, like in New Mexico, where now they need an arrest, charging, and conviction of the person before they can seize and take your property. That's good, but we still have a very, very, very long way to go. Also, regarding civil forfeiture in the Fifth Amendment, due process. The way it's set up and what it would cost you to come back to fight for your, your money or your property, your home, your car, is not due process as intended, folks. Extremely problematic. What about the police and you? A little bit more about the police and you. And the authority that the police had to inter intervene in your life, to interfere, to intr intrude in your life under these policies of the so-called war on drugs. What about the militarization of our police forces? You see, a lot of people think that the militarization began with the war on terror. No folks, it was the war on drugs. Back in the 1980s, that's when we really started acquiring the equipment that we had. And not just the equipment, but even adopting some of the, the strategies that the military uses. The SWAT raids, 50,000 SWAT raids a year in this country. 50,000. And over 90% of the SWAT raids are in the enforcement of these drug laws. Talking about infringing upon your liberties, and many of these homes that are hit are wrong homes. Many of the search warrants that are granted, there really is no probable cause. And let me tell you folks, talking about intrusion into your liberties to have someone in the middle of the night busting your front door, using dynamic entries, scaring the hell out of your family, that's extremely problematic. As far as I'm concerned. And this militarization and the problems that we're now seeing with people exercising their First Amendment rights and how quickly our police are in deploying these pieces of military equipment. Let's talk about the ultimate loss of liberty, and that is the loss of life at the hands of those we are supposed to trust in law enforcement. Over 400 people a year lose their lives at the hands of law enforcement in this country. I just returned a few months ago from the United Kingdom and I was in the, the county of Durham city of Durham in the UK, meeting with the Chief Constable, Chief Constable Bart, and we had a very good conversation about a number of things. And one of them was, I asked him the question, I said, and this is about, the, this county is about the same size as the city of Baltimore, where I'm from, 600,000 plus people. And I asked him, I said, so how many people have died in police custody last year in Durham? Said zero. So what about the year before that? The year before that? He said zero. I don't 
don't think I need to say anything more. That ultimate loss of liberty is the loss of your life. And you know what? The loss of life isn't just the physical ending of your existence. Incarceration for many people is the loss of life. It is the loss of living. <laughs> drug war is one of the main reasons, drug prohibition policies is one of the main reasons for man mandatory minimum sentencing that we have in this country. I'm gonna tell you something, folks. The more people we send to prison for, the, for these nonviolent drug crimes, the more dangerous your communities become. They're coming home. They're coming back. And our institutions of higher learning are not institutions, I'm sorry, institutions of correction, so-called correction, are not institutions of higher learning. In speaking with the board one day, I asked, he told me, he said, you know what, when these people come to us, they have a decision to make. It's going to be either A or B. Do you want to be predator or prey? No one decides to be prey when you're incarcerated. You decide to try to be the meanest and baddest person in that place. You have to learn how to fight if you don't know how to fight. It's all about survival. And many of them have to affiliate themselves with some of these gangs, which our prisons have become our best recruiting centers for gangs. You have to affiliate yourself with one of these gangs in order to survive. Protection. And then when you're released, you know what? You gotta put in work when you go home. You gotta pay your debt to that gang. And for many of these gangs, there is no out. And what does paying that debt mean? Especially when you're released back into society, into your community, and you can't get a job because of the stigma of your arrest now. But there's one business that will always hire you, and that is the illicit drug trade. Back into that world of selling drugs and the violence that comes along with it. I could go on all day about the problems of the war on drugs, drug, drug prohibition, and how it erodes our liberties in this country. And I always want to end with something for you to, to keep an eye on, something else to, to keep an eye on, to keep your, your finger on. And as it relates to this issue, any, any cigarette smokers or former cigarette smokers in the house? Former? So now there's a move to prohibit tobacco. So we've been down the road with alcohol. We're now dealing in the middle with drugs and all the violence and problems that come with that. Now there's a move to do the same, piece by piece, beginning with menthol tobacco products. Don't get me wrong, it kills 400,000 people a year. That's a problem, but it's a health issue. <laughs> Let's not travel down this road again of trying to solve a public health crisis with criminal justice solutions and eroding at our liberties once again. It's a bad place to be, it's a bad road to be on. So please keep an eye out for that again. I believe that this party is the most effective voice in speaking out against prohibition policies in this country as it relates to our liberties. So again, if we want to legalize liberty, we can begin with legalizing all drugs. Thank you very much.